has a kind of military aspect about it because you know, it's, it's on the ground, it's real, you know, you're trying to defend some physical thing. So, you know, you're devising strategies, how are we going to get in there, how are we going to do this? People on the inside building, for, for weeks we knew they were coming. People were building barricades and all kinds of things that make it hard for them to get in. process um, which I feel was part of a social control mechanism. It was, wasn't simply the invisible hand of capitalism in the housing market, that there were strategies that were hatched as early as the Kerner Commission report in 68, uh, which dealt with civil disorder in their chapter 17 of the Kerner Commission report, which dealt with housing. All right, now this is a civil disorder commission dealing with civil disorder, namely riots, so-called riots in the cities. And they have chapter 17 deals with housing. And in there, they advocate a process of dispersal of the urban poor, forcing them out of the cities. What later was uh, recognized to be this uh, program known as spatial deconcentration. At this point, 1967, don't forget, there were so-called riots in 109 cities in 1967 alone. So that the housing question, as it related to the issue of social control, um, became an operative aspect of the, the politics and the strategy of squatting both in the Bronx and on the Lower East Side here. We saw squatting as an antidote in some respects, not only to the short-term housing needs, but this whole process of spatial deconcentration that people had to defend themselves on the street, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, in actual concrete ways to create uh, communities of resistance. All right, right now, uh, the police are removing the barriers right off Avenue B and 13th. All right, the uh, Inspector Fox is uh, going to try to give uh, a warning to vacate the street in the uh, building. like that. They did break through, eventually they got in, they had all this high-tech shit, and they got in there, you know, they got everybody out, people were hitting tunnels, and you know, like that. Um, but we created enough of an of a issue of it um, that I think, in the long run, it had the effect of, like, them saying, because we would publicize it after the fact, well, it cost them, you know, three point mil three million dollars to evict 30 people from this building. Is this worth it? And sometimes it takes a jolt like this to get you on the right track. Huh. Is this a choice you made to leave in the building like that? Yes, it is, because I like this building. 
Uh, I've tried other jobs, like I worked for Manpower for a long time, for about two years. I've uh, taught school and everything like that, really. And uh, I've made this all about my own free choice. And so I've, I haven't regretted it. It's been an experience. I've got a lot out of it. Even if I go down the drain, I have still come out the winner. Still come out a winner. I started squatting in uh, 1979 in the South Bronx. Um, the South Bronx was a, is an area um, where there was quite a lot of uh, displacement and destruction of people's housing. If you can just envision, you know, lot after lot, block after block, just leveled um, as though a bomb had hit. Um, so to be whole, you know, neighborhoods, you could stand into four corners in the Bronx and look you know, in four directions and see nothing but, like, level, empty, brick-strewn lots um, where people once lived. The well, South Bronx went through this whole process of, uh, of, of what we referred to and still do as spatial deconcentration, a form of planned shrinkage, um, so that when we were up there, there were a number of abandoned buildings that were sealed up and ostensibly were owned by the city uh, and we saw that under Reaganism, there was no way that people were going to be able to get affordable housing other than through direct action, other than through taking, seizing the housing, um, renovating it, and then defending it collectively. So I started doing squatting up, up in the South Bronx at that point and moved down to the Lower East Side um, in 1985 because I grew up in this neighborhood. So was kind of, you know, I came back here for that. I came to Lower East Side as a runaway, and I lived, you know, kind of spare and change and whatnot. Um, I guess I got here in 1970, about 1970, and there still was a bit of a hippie scene left, though at that time, a lot of the hippies had decided it was time to go to the to get their organic farms and to go and to move off into the country. Well, when I first came to Lower East Side, it, you know, it really wasn't difficult to get an apartment. You could get an apartment for maybe $90 a month. So that was pretty much the prevailing housing situation down here until around oh, 1978 rents started to go high. Things started to, you know, rents just start doubling, you know, and um, it became more and more difficult to be able to, uh, you know, to be able to make the ends meet and be able to get an apartment. That's when the squatting scene started to evolve in the Lower East Side as a response to the um, escalating rents and the um, they're also, at, paradoxically at that time, though rents were escalating, there was enormous amount of abandonment and um, empty buildings. You know, they were in complete states of destruction, you know. Um, so, taking advantage of that opportunity, you know, the incentive of lots of abandoned buildings to utilize and um, the dilemma of, you know, ever escalating rents for the buildings that were occupiable and owned by landlords, and that's when the squatting scene started. So the first buildings that I'm aware of that were squatted in their neighborhood, which is part of what we can consider evolved into the squatter movement, and which is, this is the result of here, uh, were these three buildings on 7th Street between Avenue C and D. They're still there, 272, 274, and 278 East 7th Street. And uh, those buildings uh, were peopled primarily by uh, people of color, Afro-American and Latino folks. And I think they took their buildings in 1979. So they were going for about three years, approximately three years, before you know, another kind of a, a broader movement towards seizing property all over the neighborhood started, which started in spring of 84. The community here was, was pretty, um, 
or it's pretty big. You know, there's a, hundreds of people living within a few blocks of each other without electricity, without running water, without telephones, and yet we're very tightly knit, interdependent, and really creating something. I mean, creating something as basic as housing, but creating a lot of culture. There was um, really beautiful movies being made. There was, you know, art projects of all, all kinds that were directly related to squatting, but were otherwise enabled because they had a place that they could live and not have to worry about um, the rat race, basically, for a while, right? So they could create these things. There's a lot of music being made, a lot of, um, a lot of things happening. That was a whole, um, there was a whole culture and a whole culture of revolution and a whole um, culture of, yeah, a whole culture of community. And then we started squatting on 8th Street in April of 1984. And 8th Street became, between B and C, I think within a matter of like four or five years, we had like, there were like 10 buildings going on on that block. There's not one left there anymore. We don't know exactly what the source of that fire was. We think it was pretty suspicious, and uh, there were two fires actually in two buildings in the same day. So we think it was like some type of gentrifying forces in the neighborhood that were trying to like do 319 and 327 on the same day. What a dilemma! What an enigma! Over here, keeping people out of their homes, when these forces should be better be applied to fighting the drug problem in the community. <laughs> And then we uh, were musing whether we were going to do a suicide attempt to try to take, you know, five squatters to try to re get through a line of 1,100 cops to get into the building. The police were aware that we were using this for a staging ground and for, you know, planning, and they tried to get into here. So we were now beginning to imperil this building, it was potentially imperiled. So actually, that's, we decided to nix that attempt to, you know, send f five stoic troops into the jail, you know, against 1,100 cops, climb over uh, an eight-foot plywood wall, peel the plywood off the front door. I mean, it was hopeless, you know, actually. I got a phone call in April of 99 from a squatter at 377 East 10th Street. And he told his story. I'm living in the building. It's a city-owned building. You know, we're one of the squats. It's vacant. And we've heard that UHAB can help. What do you think? And I really had no clue if there was any chance for UHAB to help. So after the conversation ended, uh, during which I told the guy that I'd check it out, I trotted into the executive director's office here, Andy Riker and said to Andy that I had gotten this phone call, and he said, ah, oh, the squatters, they're back. An uncomfortable calm settled in today after the latest storm in Tompkins Square Park, New York City's enduring symbol of the gap between the haves and the have-nots. 
Tompkins Square exploded in violence last night as police took on an angry crowd that was less than happy to see him. This is not the first tangle involving squatters and police. It happens over and over again. New turmoil has roared through a familiar battleground, Tompkins Square Park. Last night, a May Day concert turned into a melee when police enforced a 9 o'clock noise curfew. 27 people were arrested and 15 police officers were hurt. The concert was part of a four-day festival here to celebrate May Day. There were at least 200 concert goers. Organizers had been granted a permit for a show that would run from noon to 9 p.m. But when a parks enforcement officer jumped on stage to end the show, one of the band members grabbed the microphone and shouted, Resist! Amid the rapid fire crackle of firecrackers, police closed in on Tompkins Square Park, and in seconds, according to police, the crowd began chanting and throwing bottles. After appeals from police to stop the music were ignored, officers stormed the park band shell to make arrests. Reinforcement police dressed in riot gear managed to flush the demonstrators from the park. 27 people were arrested, but calm had not been restored. I think we were like really at our apex of power <laughs> um, and having a really damn good time too was right around the time of the Tompkins Square riot and 90, you know, 88 through 91, 92. There were a lot of real pitched battles. The demonstration had moved to the neighboring streets where protesters set bonfires before officers ordered to keep their distance. Disturbances in Tompkins Square Park are nothing new. Two years ago, it was the scene of a bloody four-hour skirmish that left 52 people injured with over 100 charges of police brutality. Last summer, more violence, with cops attempting to clear out a tent city of homeless. It was the heyday probably because the neighborhood was just abandoned. Uh, all over, just empty buildings, landlords uh, abandoning their buildings, uh, the city government taking over ownership of the buildings. We had a, a pretty extensive uh, kind of scene going. The band shell was still in the park, we were doing shows in the band shell a lot. Parks Commissioner Gottbaum says she blames the violence on concert organizers who refused to end the event at the agreed upon time. Well, I know we can remember when uh, Tompkins Square Park was once a quiet little place where people in the neighborhood could go for a breath of fresh air. That has changed. Tompkins Square Park, 10 acres in the heart of the East Village, is now a flashpoint in a community undergoing the strains of gentrification. Rising rents have forced out the poor, and the more affluent residents object to the dozens of homeless squatters who make the park their home. <laughs> It was a hot August night, a bloody confrontation. Almost two years ago, hundreds of demonstrators crammed Tompkins Square Park to protest an overnight curfew. But an army of police moved in, tempers flared, and a one-time peaceful place... The neighborhood itself was more of an autonomous zone, um, as opposed to the police state that it is right now. People had a lot more freedom to do what, what they wanted to do, live the way they wanted to live. It was called a police riot. More than 50 people were injured and more than 100 complaints of police brutality were reported. Person, Even the mayor said police went to too far. If you give in to provocation, you're going to be punished. And uh, we actually kind of, we kind of came to, uh, to uh, what, would, how would I describe it, an understanding with the state. that t They leave us alone, we'll leave them alone. So there was a number of years of 
quiet after that, which were shattered by the 13th Street evictions. In the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s, a lot of these buildings were owned by, you know, what we might refer to as small owners, like, you know, mom and pa owners. Um, they'd have a building, whatever. Sometimes after the, the late 60s, there were a whole series of things that took place which made it very difficult for small owners to maintain their buildings. When the banks decided that they would no longer make loans um, or refinance mortgages in particular neighborhoods, right, and the, the, the concept redlining refers to, you know, a map inside of a uh, bank president's office or something where they have a red line drawn around the neighborhood and they say, well, we're not giving any loans to that neighborhood. So the idea, you know, the reality of it was that there was massive disinvestment on the part of certain banks targeting certain neighborhoods. All I'm saying is that the mechanisms for the transfer of n massive numbers of units from small owners, you know, diversified small owners into the hands of one public entity took place from, you know, the early 70s right through, through the sort of middle and later 70s. And an agency was set up in, in New York here called Housing Preservation and Development, which is a misnomer. What they did with these buildings is just warehouse them. Well, the scene in the East Village this morning. Police continue to clear out three buildings they say are illegally occupied by squatters. About 65 squatters, the people call themselves homesteaders, live in those buildings. A sea of riot-helmeted police carrying shields moved onto East 13th Street early this morning. The city, today armed with maximum force, this morning evicted the squatters from the three buildings on the Lower East Side. Before the cops moved in, they had to move makeshift barricades. They put up barricades in the middle of the street, started trash fires, overturned a car. Armed with a court order, shortly before 6 this morning, police began moving debris from the street. Over the next four to five hours, a buildup of force. EMS trucks, paddy wagons, fire trucks, even an armored personnel carrier for moving the overturned car from the street and probably for intimidation value. There's definitely a community of squatters. What's odd is that for the most part it tended to come together um, most strongly when the squats were threatened, like around the times of evictions and things like that. And it was in those instances of duress that the community became more apparent, like, you know, when they when the buildings were um, evicted on 13th Street. The court case involving these buildings is ongoing. Tenants of five buildings on this block are now before a judge in a court hearing, fighting the city for ownership. Why the show of force now when many squatters have lived here in buildings for up to 10 years? The Department of Buildings has found that these buildings are structurally unsafe, and they are in immediate danger of collapse. We have with us the attorney for the police department. The buildings have been declared unsafe. Why haven't, why haven't they been declared unsafe before? Is this the first time they've been declared unsafe? There was a hearing conducted on whether these individuals have any legal rights in court. As a consequence of that hearing, the HPD and the buildings department sent in inspectors to determine the quality of the building. When they went in in April, they found that they were unsafe. But last November, in precisely the buildings taken over today, squatters held an open house to show how they'd turned around the abandoned structures. At the time, a fire inspector declared them safe. But now, six months later, the city says they've deteriorated considerably. They only became unsafe and dangerous when the hearing began. And they had problems, and they were losing the hearing, and all of a sudden it was, oh my God, these buildings are going to fall. The city's chief attorney also says... Well, these people are trespassers. Uh, they're squatters. They have no rights to, to be there in the first instance. The city wants these people out now so that they can uh, put uh, low-income New Yorkers in these buildings. The city maintains these uh, squatters, as they call them, uh, cut the line, broke the law. So it's always been sort of painted as squatters, you know, jumping the line, and it will be put it as affordable housing for people who essentially followed the law, you know, bit their tongue and waited for years for, you know, subsidized housing versus people who took their own initiative and created their own affordable housing. The real victims are 41 homeless families who are on an official list 
to move into buildings on this block if those buildings are allowed to be renovated. The city says it intends to rehab the buildings for other formerly homeless people who chose not to squat. Homeless Coalition, however, says the city is simply buckling under court pressure to find housing for homeless families. Um, they're actually now in the position where they've displaced very low-income people who undoubtedly will become homeless to renovate the building and put people from the shelters in. The squatters really have no rights in this building. They have no right, title, or interest, and they'd be uh, doing everybody a favor if they were to vacate. Tonight, two buildings on Manhattan's East 13th Street are empty of the people who say that they have spent 10 years upgrading property the city threw on the junk pile. If you throw something out that you no longer want and throw it in the garbage, and someone walks along and picks it up and repairs it and takes it home, is it yours or theirs? It's a question the mayor has no problem answering. If you want to live in a building, you're going to have to pay rent. And so the order went out. After a five-hour standoff, a small army of police officers in riot gear moved in. It looks like a tank, but it's not. doesn't have the long gun. Officially, we see police moving in. There's an armored personnel carrier on 14th Street, and there are three helicopters above us. Do you think this is overreaction? You know, they had to bring, uh, they had to bring the any Anytime Baby, which is a tank that was from Korea, is what I've heard, and the only time they used that tank was in 1968 when Martin Luther King Jr. died and was assassinated. That's the only time they used that tank during those riots. What was the tank called? Anytime Baby. Have they used it since? Nope. No reason to. <laughs> Never used it since. So, you know, we have that, you know, distinction. Andy proceeded to tell me that you have had been called over time, over decades, in the 70s, in the 80s, by various people in what would turn out to be the same cluster of about a dozen buildings on the Lower East Side to see if there was any way that we could help them go legal. And the squatters had done this because a lot of the work that you have did, we did with um, city-owned buildings, and the squatters, I guess, heard that UHUB could be helpful. So, at their request in earlier decades, we had gone to whoever was the head of the city at the time. We had approached the Dinkins administration, we'd approached the Koch administration. They were either polite or just laughed us out the door. Nothing had happened in the 90s, and so when I got the phone call from 10th Street and spoke with Andy, we decided we would once again speak to the city and see if there was a chance that this particular uh, configuration of New York City politicians would let us help the squatters go legal, um, which meant ultimately speaking to the Giuliani administration. And the Giuliani administration was responsive. When I was like maybe 14, I left home and um, started staying with friends in Albany. And um, occasionally we would actually come down to this neighborhood when I was maybe 16 or so. Like, a lot of my friends were junkies. I, I wasn't. But I would just go along for the ride. They'd come down here to get drugs because in Albany it's $5 more and um, for a bag of dope. You know, I always wanted to be famous. Like, it kind of grew into wanting to be an actress, but specifically, there was no aim just to be famous, and you have to come to New York to be famous. And then when I was 19, um, I left my boyfriend that I had lived upstate with for years, and I was just wanted to start a new life, and I'd always wanted to have a life here, so this is where I came. I met Nico, who lived in Sea Squat at the time. She doesn't live there anymore, but um, it was my 20th birthday, I think, when I met her. And Nico asked Shane, she was like, my friend's homeless, you know, is it okay if she stays over here sometime? And Shane was like, yeah, anytime you need. And um, I gradually met, you know, different people in the building. So I started staying there more and more often, and that was almost two years ago. And I mean, I, I sort of consider it my home. I live there, like I don't have my own place, but I've been staying there 
almost every night for a pretty long time now, like with different people. I started squatting actually before I moved to New York. I mean, I've, I was living on the streets for a number of years before I came to New York and would always just enter, open up, sleep in abandoned houses or buildings of some type. Um, New York was the first and uh, until then the only place that I've seen it to be such an organized kind of a thing. Um, s Ten years ago my politics were were pretty undeveloped. I mean I was a radical, I was a young punk rocker, um, but there was something inherently obvious about squatting as a political act. I mean you're just living for free. So you're at, outside of this capitalistic system. Um, you're taking something from, in New York's case, the government. These are mostly city-owned buildings. So you're taking something from the city government. To a, a young radical or someone who's forming their radical views, I mean, clearly it's, there's something about it, even if the, a complex analysis isn't there. It's just clearly empowering and radical and political thing to do. Also, it's a convenient, smart thing to do. It's somewhere to live for free. I got my spot when I was three months pregnant. And like I said, it didn't have no floor, no windows, nothing. Oh, it had some of the floor. The joist work had been done, but not all of the floor was down, not all of the subfloor, and the um, entryway was still all twisted and fucked up. You had to like climb over to be toe over joist to get into the rest of the space. Um, and it had holes in the brick walls for windows, but no windows and no plumbing, no electricity. Just It was a space four stories up. And I was three months pregnant. And building that place was my um, pregnancy meditation, right? And it's definitely what I did the whole, pretty much the whole time, but there were a lot of people that stepped up to um, lift sheetrock to carry it up the stairs to do, do a lot of the heavier and heavier aspects as you know I couldn't necessarily do all of that myself I had a lot of a lot of help and then towards the end the last had the last two or three weeks you know there were people coming by just with whatever skills they had and I would wake up in the morning and they would be there I came to the Lower East Side when I was maybe 17 um, and I started just um, hanging around ABC No Rio and doing Food Not Bombs. I think I just read about it in a couple of different zines, like, you know, punk rock zines or activist-y type zines that said, like, there was... That said that there was um, an organization called Food Not Bombs that was serving food out of a place called ABC No Rio on the Lower East Side. And it seemed like a very hands-on, practical type of thing, rather than something more amorphous, like, I don't know, ending world hunger or, you know, somehow lobbying to change things um, in a more abstract way in which you could never see the actual results. Whereas with Food Not Bombs, it was like very concrete. You cooked food, you served it, you saw people eat it. And from there, I got to know the squatters who lived above ABC No Rio at the time, who were involved in a whole, the whole network of squats down here at the time. And this was in 1995, right around the time the 13th Street squats um, first got evicted. Squatting is direct action housing. You know, that's really what it is. It's like, you know, we just, it's like you need a house, you take it. I'm not interested in abstract victories. We want concrete victories because our homes were dependent upon it. I was forged out of the political cauldron of squatting. So that meant, if your politic failed, you lost your home. In our scene, there's, there is, there's never been like a victory, so to speak, where you could say like we fought, we fought City Hall and won. So we began negotiating later on in 99 and fast forward to 2002, three years later, a little over three years later, after much negotiating between the city and UHEB, 
that included both the mayor's office and HPD and the city council et al, the city agreed to transfer the buildings for $1 of sale to UHAB so that our organization could um, oblige the squatters and help the buildings go legal. Now, baby. Out of our luck these days, but uh, one day we'll be back. The mood of the building, um, like people would be happy at the same time, and it seemed like everybody is in a good mood and doing things with themselves, productive, and and you know when the tide turns, it really turns, and everybody in the building is ready to kill themselves. Some of them are worse than I ever expected. I never expected people to be living in buildings in, in these conditions. I've seen buildings without heat, without electricity, um, but um, not for such an extended period of time with neither heat, electricity, nor water. It's seasonal affective disorder, sad. I think everybody has that because, like, there's a point in the fall where the days start getting darker and shorter and, you know, the weather starts getting colder and it's especially bad when there's no heat. So there wasn't last year, and there's really not much of this year either, and you know, and the depression just bam kicks in, and everybody's affected. It's like the month of November is the craziest time. Everybody seems to go nuts. Your official 1010 winds you other four-day forecast, and with the live update, meteorologist Dr. Joe Sobel. Temperature this afternoon may recover a couple of degrees because we do think there'll be sunshine. But tonight, it will get exceptionally cold, 0 to 10 below across the metropolitan area. you got to add in the wind, which will be gusting to 30 miles an hour, and that real field temperature will drop to between 20 and 30 below zero. Tomorrow's I grew up in the Bronx and started going on shows that... Yeah. <laughs> Not all of us have showers, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Or toilets, isn't that right? Hmm? Or toilets. And toilets, no showers. Where do you go to poop? Right here, baby. I try, no, no, I, I try to control my bowels now. Oh, you're on a schedule. I'm on a schedule. Yeah. Uh, no. Thank God I, I work for a cool place. <laughs> so you, um, you shit at work solely? No. Uh, uh, when I was living here, I didn't have a toilet. Mm -hmm. It's a coffee shop. No, I don't do it you guys' style. What you know, do you do, bags? No, hell no. <laughs> what do you do? A cat litter, don't worry about it. <laughs> I got stuff right upstairs, don't worry about it. Each house seems to have a different style. No, just, uh, hey, just control your bottles, that's all. Mm. Just what magically disappears, apparently, says Roger. <laughs> did you used to do the bag method? I'll tell you the truth, I only did the bag thing twice. Um... And that was free trains. That was at Fifth Street. I, I've squatted before that, but I never had to use bags at that point. Um, we had more outlandish ways of using bathrooms. But I do, I do remember at Fifth Street just because of convenience. I believe I was sick, is what I was. Mm -hmm. I had no option, so I did do actually the cat litter slash bag method. Mm -hmm. um, There's always the bucket with the sawdust. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> It certainly was the case that Giuliani's priority was to get the city out of owning property. So in fact, one of the particular things that happened during the Giuliani administration was that the city stopped taking over buildings from slumlords and stopped taking over buildings that had been abandoned by their landlords. It was doing this stopping while it was also vesting, 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 shedding whatever it was owning itself. So. Giuliani's housing policy perfectly um, flipped the housing policy on this issue of previous mayors, of Dinkins, of Koch. It's ironic that the deal could, was made during, with Rudolph Giuliani, a Republican in office, and um, that we never had that type of, you know, we've approached UHAB for decades, and the UHAB would go to the city ask Dinkins or ask Koch and they'd say, no way, man, we're never going to, we're not going to talk to the squatters, are you kidding? But it's ironic that it was with a Republican mayor 
that you have went once one more time, knocked on the door, and they said, OK, let's talk. It has to do with the fact that Republican agenda is kind of is different from the Democratic agenda in the fact that um, you know, Republicans are always talking about smaller government. They want to make the government smaller and stuff like that. Democrats don't agree on that. They like big government. <laughs> they tend to like big government. There may be as many as several hundred squatters still living in city-owned buildings, mostly on the Lower East Side and in the Bronx. But where in the 70s and early 80s, the city had a surfeit of such buildings and basically looked the other way as the squatters settled in, now the city says it's running out of buildings to reclaim and rehab as low-income housing and so is moving on the squatters. Why did it, now, why would local not-for-profit housing development corporations like big government? Because they get this deal worked out where they, the city holds all of these properties in government. The local not-for-profit says, well, we're going to get some money from the federal government to develop a housing project. Now we'll go to HPD and they'll dole us out some buildings from HPD we can get the money, and then we can keep our jobs working. Now, Giuliani, now I don't like the guy, don't get me wrong, you know, but nonetheless, he's of this opinion. He's saying, we're going to close down, the city's going to get out of the, the business of housing. And he puts out an order for the HPD to divest all of its properties. He wants them all out, tens of thousands of buildings. And this way, it creates, you know, their whole concept is it creates economic engines, yet yeah, runs out the poor, but it makes the city glitzy, you know. But he has this one dilemma on the Lower East Side. They want to downsize the housing agency, but there's these few buildings that are still sticking out in the Lower East Side, those goddamn squatters in them who you can't get out with a fucking crowbar. H, you know, UHAB goes to HPD, and they say to HPD, look, We'll take these buildings. HPD says, this resolves a big dilemma. So that's why the downsizing of government actually worked to our advantage. So certainly what Giuliani was doing was to look for ways to get rid of city-owned property, and these were city-owned properties. So it was very consistent with his housing policy to try and find new private sector owners for buildings that the city held in its portfolio. Um, however, that is probably not completely explanatory. Another piece is that right about the time that we started negotiating initially with the Giuliani administration, the issue of the community gardens wound up exploding and got a lot of media attention because there were community gardens, which are gardens on city-owned property leased to community organizations that are for some communities the only or the major green space in that neighborhood. A lot of these plots were going to actually be changed from the community garden that they were to some housing development. And the community gardeners and their allies fought smartly and valiantly and they were actually able to stop a lot but not all of the mayor's plan to get rid of the gardens and replace them with housing. So I do think there was some political expediency and, and political savvy in the Giuliani ad administration's interest to negotiate with the squatters rather than ignoring them, which had been typically their case. You don't have to destroy this garden or any other garden. Nobody even wants to talk to you here, huh? How are you, miss? You can wave a smile if you want to. It's okay. The Lower East Side, of course, has a tremendous, um, tremendous long history of radicalism, well before our little minute in history of our handful of buildings here. Um, but even these days, um, there are a number of radical um, community centers, uh, info shops, bookstores, um, radio stations, and um, throughout the history of all those institutions like that that we've had, squatters have been um, an intricate part 
integral part of, uh, of either founding those or maintaining those. Um, well, it definitely started out as political. It was, you know, I mean, those are the, the folks that started opening buildings around here have, um, they don't have tattoos, they don't have piercings, they don't have um, car hearts, they don't have, you know, any of that. That's not, I think that the, um, the musical, the loud musical aspect of it and the um, freakier looking kids are more, in some ways, simply more visible. For years, we were always being targeted as, uh, you know, the right, this guy Antonio Pagan, who's this right-wing uh, politician from the neighborhood here, and other kind of right-wing elements, would um, say, squatters, Euro white Euro trash, that was one of their favorite ones, or, uh, or you know, would-be wannabe yuppies, or something like this. Um, but the, the shtick that they were trying to get across was that these were white people coming in and displacing, you know, the uh, the historical Latino community and so forth. You know, I mean, I, my dad's Puerto Rican. I grew up in the neighborhood. I kind of can see what is going on here. Check, check. Check, check, check. All right. All right. Uh, all right, Zahid. This first song is called Bring It Down. And so what we did is we went about and did like a survey of the buildings at that point. I don't really care, you know, what color you are. You know, if people get down with the idea of seizing the buildings and taking housing and creating housing for people who can't afford it, um, I'm not going to hold their, uh, you know, their race or their ethnicity against them. But I was interested in the uh, objective circumstances of what we were trying to build because, again, I, I mentioned we were very conscious about the racist aspects of spatial concentration and social control and the shelter system. When I did the survey, it was, it, it was very clear at that point that we could say to people that the buildings were 50% non-white, right? But even the pe some of the people in the buildings didn't believe it because they, you know, they, they just looked themselves and they somehow, you know, like bought the notion that they were being fed by, by the right wing of the people that, or the post. Yeah. All right, we summon the angels. Yeah. This song has backup singers that are really cute. The sense of squatting as a scene in a movement is amplified by the people in bands because more than any of the other group of people, they're going to different cities and talking to other people. And they're doing zines about the music and things like that. So by virtue of the fact that bands travel, spreads it and you know, um, ends up sort of representing the idea of squatting in other places. And I see them as sort of the ambassadors of the scene, so to speak. It's wonderful to see everybody out here today. <laughs> It's really night and day from, like, like I had said, when I was a police officer back in 85 or 86. It was a much busier place. It was uh, a lot more violent, a uh, lot more crime. And, uh, you know, obviously, if, if you can see the way it is now uh, through gentrification, it's really, it's changed dramatically. Um, years ago, you always heard the expression alphabet city. I, I don't, I don't, you don't hear the expression alphabet city anymore because, um, you know, it's Avenue, Avenue A, Avenue B, Avenue C is really an extension of First Avenue, Second Avenue, Third Avenue. It's really starting to mirror, um, you know, those avenues a lot, as well as the the West Village. It's, you know, it's almost turning into a a mirror of the West Village. And they look down through tinted windows at the life in the lives. and slightly they were touched, but instead they looked ahead and there.
ladies and ladies, ladies and gentlemen. The neighborhood's changed a lot. It's been gentrified, destroyed by gentrification, and um, I mean, just I think literally destroyed. And I think that's broken a lot of the energy and unity that um, a lot of the squatters had. The truth is, they're in very, very hot neighborhoods. A very hot neighborhood on hot streets in that neighborhood on the Lower East Side, and any number of private developers have been and continue to um, indicate interest in taking over those buildings themselves, which would certainly have meant getting rid of the people who lived there, legal or not, and creating the building to something market rate and high end and luxury. I think it is less of a movement these days than it was in its heyday. Um, I'm sure there's a number of reasons why, aside from attrition, less buildings, less people, the remaining people are getting older, you know, we're not being rejuvenated by a younger generation of squatters. There became less community spaces, less spaces to congregate, lost a lot of gardens, lost a lot of places to just hang out and be. Like food became more expensive, the restaurants around started catering to a different clientele, the um, Tompkins Square had different patrols so you can just hang out there and feel very, anything other than um, watched and patrolled. A lot of people left, or a lot of people retreated. There are a lot of reasons why things just kept getting smaller and smaller. Also, I think in its heyday, these buildings in the Lower East Side, and I don't really know why the Lower East Side had such a high concentration of squats that were organized and interacted with each other to develop strategies to defend themselves and, and ways to, you know, make their, their lives prosper here. Um, but I feel like it came out of the movement that the Puerto Ricans had and Dominicans had in this neighborhood, which back then they were a majority. And there was such a huge, vibrant, dynamic, powerful movement to make the neighborhood as a whole just dynamic and a good place for them to live, starting community centers, recycling centers, the gardens that the, you know, the Puerto Ricans started here. Um, they were the early squatters um, that were organizing themselves well. As the neighborhoods turned more white and been more gentrified and a lot of um, Puerto Rican people have been displaced, that whole energy of that movement has gone, um, which affected the movement of the squats, I think. In terms of um, squatters' role in gentrification, I mean, they're squatters in one respect are the stormtroopers of gentrification. Um, you know, back in the 80s when um, many white people were fearful to come into this neighborhood, it's like, you know, the, squat, the, the gentrifiers follow the squatters. The squatters came in and took over the buildings first and made people, you know what I mean? They, and, a, and a lot of them were white people or exiles from the middle classes. So in one sense you can look at it as, yeah, the squatters were the stormtroopers of gentrification. They were some of the first to come into this neighborhood. And it was after them that developers then came in to start renovating some of the buildings in the neighborhood and then driving the rents up. I think on the, on the one hand, squatting objectively uh, takes house, takes buildings, takes those particular buildings out of the, the market. So they, they, there's no speculation. By that I mean, you know, it's like when eight of us were in one building and a landlord was walking down the street looking to buy buildings, they didn't want to buy yours because they realized they had to deal with you. Squats actually stopped were like one of the, in my opinion, one of the best firewalls against gentrification. Um, say that the squatters were the front, you know, the, that they were the vanguard of gentrification. I don't think there's any basis for that. There is so much, and so many other outposts around the gallery scene and other things that were going on. Uh, the amount of just sheer chaos and property structure <laughs> we participated in was like, you know, did enough <laughs> to, um, you know, we did everything we possibly could to, um, to create this type of um, 
but you know, we, yeah, we drove drug dealers out of our buildings, and probably the sing the element that the single element that did the most to dissuade uh, yuppies from coming here was rampant uh, illicit drug trade and the violence that accompanies it. There's always a double-edged thing about you know bettering a neighborhood. You know, if you're if you create a situation that really is beautiful and you have gardens, people take the gardens and they create a beautiful looking garden, then these same real estate people see, they see the beautiful garden, they don't see the, 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 the lot with junkies shooting up, they see the, the beautiful lot, so they want to invest in the community based on your, what you've done. It's getting more and more thorough, you know, the gentrification of the neighborhood is creeping down to Avenue D now, you know. It was creeping onto C and had pretty much bought C out, but not quite completely visually taken over, but now it's you can't help but notice. And, you know, soon they'll have D too, I'm sure. You know, thank God the projects are there. They can't buy the projects, <laughs> but they've bought everything else. Well, when it became time to join or not join the coalition of buildings that were going to go into this deal to, to legally get their buildings from the, the city, uh, we had a house meeting like every other building did, and we debated with the limited amount of info and knowledge that we had uh, whether we should do it or not. And so we came to an agreement that we would join. This building it probably has got a lot older people than um, some of the other ones. It probably ranges from uh, uh, 30s to 50s. So that was another reason I think that there wasn't a lot of argument about whether we should take this deal or not, because at, at a certain point you just want the security. I myself have a child, so the idea of like squatting it definitely and just having that gnawing anxiety that one day I might just get thrown out, it's like a relief to have that relieved. I believe my initial reaction was kind of excited interest. Um, this dialogue of this deal with that you have you have would um, take us through was kind of a really basic dialogue with no details. So nobody knew really. I don't think initially just you know what was involved with it. It was just uh, the idea of getting our buildings from the city for a dollar. Uh, or some such simple nut like that. So I was excited about it, um, and as as details coalesced and and learned more about it, I think I personally lost my excitement. The plan hasn't changed. The plan is still that the um, you have will own the buildings for two years during which construction occurs and gets completed and then buildings will become co-ops as soon as they get their own loan responsibility. Some of these buildings need a lot of work. The projects probably run fifty, sixty thousand dollars an apartment. Now when you ask me whether or not they'll be affordable, um, it really depends on whether you talk what you what you mean by affordable. I mean, obviously, if people have been living here for a number of years not paying rent, what's affordable to someone who's never paid rent before? I think there'll be a lot of people that won't be able to afford um, the rents that um, we're going to incur. I don't know how many people, but there's definitely a handful of people. There's, I'm sure, a few people in this building. I don't know what to say about the costs. Thank goodness the story's not written yet and it's not over. We're negotiating now with individual contractors in a more um, concerted way to try and get the prices to be affordable for each building. It is a very interesting um, dilemma. I don't know what word to use, quite frankly, because this project was always ideologically troubled in my mind by one factor, which was that the city was not going to acknowledge the existence of bodies of people in these buildings. They were treating these buildings as vacant, and as such, they weren't going to support the people in the buildings or the buildings with any kind of um, subsidy, be it construction subsidy, a capital subsidy, or an operating subsidy. 
most of the time when low-income housing is produced, most of the time across the board, not just UHEB, not just New York City, not just New York State, it is produced with some kind of outside uh, government or otherwise assistance, either at the construction end or the running of the building end. The, the squats are completely financing themselves, and it's expensive. It's not going to be affordable for some people. That is definitely something that's been real... One of the parts that I've been proudest about, perhaps, in the squatting movement is that it's low to no income housing, and people generally have been able to accomplish all that they can. One of the things that made us so great and dynamic were these community spaces that we had, all these buildings, or the, most of them have community spaces that are old storefronts. But we've had radio, community radio stations in there, we've had meetings in there, and benefit parties, and on and on. And I feel like we're going to lose that because um, the storefronts, which were our community spaces, um, can be marketed, rented at market rate to offset the cost of the uh, rent that everybody pays for their spaces. Um, in terms of the original politics of squatting, um, yeah, that, uh, that sort of fallen by the wayside. If you wanted to stand on principle, we would have turned down the deal and said, no, we're squatters, and it's, we don't want to be property owners. It's, you know, and the legalities of it don't matter to us. But you could look at this as a victory, and the victory requires a compromise. What I'm seeing is the city kind of throwing us a bone to make us quiet and just kind of roll over and acquiesce and not cause any waves. Um, and I feel like that's a victory for the city more than it is for us. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I'll tell you the truth. I'll see like some weird sociological experiment or something. <laughs> We're going to see the outcome very soon. <laughs>